Hi guys, my name is Sarvan Kumar. I'm your economy faculty. Welcome to Rathod's IAS Economic Weekly Series. As usual, even this week, we are going to understand the different economic current affairs appeared in different newspapers. So, without wasting any time, let us look at the first topic. See, the first topic that we are going to discuss about today is about the freebies. Right? In the previous Economic Weekly Series, we already had some discussion with respect to these freebies. Now, we are going to look at the freebies issue both from the negative perspective as well as from the positive perspective. I would simply would say like we are going to critically evaluate the freebies in this class as a first topic. Okay. So, before we understand for those who are listening to these classes for the first time, I would like to explain you the topic in its entirety. Before we understand about the freebies, now it is very important to understand what is a revenue expenditure and what is a capital expenditure. See, we have, when we talk about the expenditure of the government, when we talk about the expenditures made by the government, any expenditure made by the government might be of two types. One is a revenue expenditure, the other one is the capital expenditure. Now, what is the difference between a revenue expenditure and a capital expenditure? Now, I am going to give you a simple basic thumb rule which you are going to use to identify what is a revenue expenditure and what is a capital expenditure. To put it simply for you, all one way kind of an expenditures are called, see, one way transactions, I would say, all one way transactions are called revenue expenditures, all two way kind of an expenditures are called capital expenditures. Let me give an example so that you can understand the things very clearly. Now imagine here we have the government. Now here we have the government. Now imagine if this government, if this government pays salaries to the employees, you know, we have a lot of people being working in the defense forces. We have a lot of central government employees. So for all these people, the government need to pay the salaries. See? In such a way, it is going to pay the salaries. Now, salaries. Now, we call these things as one-way transactions. See, understand, if once the money is paid to these persons, this person is not going to pay back it at any cost to the government. Now, we call these kind of a transactions are one-way transactions. So, if once government spent the money, nothing is going to come back to the government in return directly. Now, we call such kind of expenditure as a revenue expenditure. Right? Next, we have the capital expenditure or capital transactions. Understand, imagine here, it is the government again. Now, understand, imagine if the government makes an expenditure to construct a hospital. Construct a hospital, right, here in such a way. Now, imagine if government, see, government is going to create a factory government is going to create a factory there right government is going to create a factory in such a way now what kind of an expenditure is it what kind of an expenditure is it see if government creates see if government constitutes a factory government creates or establishes a factory so for example here it is going to use the money and going to establish the factory and this factory is going to generate some periodic revenue for the government Right? Isn't it or not? In the form of dividends, dividends and profits. Now, we call these kind of a transactions are two-way transactions. So, this kind of an expenditure is called revenue expenditure and these kind of two-way expenditures are called capital expenditures. I hope you have clearly understood the difference between what is a revenue expenditure and what is a capital expenditure. Having understood that, we have to understand the freebies. Guys, understand, at most of the times, the freebies are considered to be under the revenue expenditure. The freebies is a kind of revenue expenditure. Now, take the example. See, these days, many of the state governments are coming up with a lot of different schemes. I don't need to mention any kind of schemes. You do know about a different schemes being implemented by the state governments these days. So, take the example of the latest Aam Admi parties, a thousand rupees for women, thousand rupees for all women per month. 
Now, recently, Amadmi Party promised that the women, particularly in the Punjab, when they won the elections, they want to give thousand rupees per month per woman. Even if the family constitutes three women, for all the three women, they are going to give thousand rupees per month. Now, when the government pays, see, for example, this is, say, for example, this is the government. And when the government gives this kind of money to the woman, so what kind of an expenditure is it? When the government pays thousand rupees to the woman, do you think it is going to generate any kind of an asset revenue here? This kind of a expenditure made by the government, does it going to create any kind of an asset with this thousand rupees? No. When it does not create any kind of an asset, we call such kind of an expenditure as a revenue expenditure. Mostly the revenue expenditure, the freebies are associated with this kind of revenue expenditure. Now, I hope you understood the meaning of freebies, what is a revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. Now, the main issue, now main issue is, see what is the bone of contention here is, see, now what is the deficit in the economy? Literally, what is the meaning of a deficit in economy? See, Literal meaning of deficit is, see, if you want something and if you don't have it, you call it as a deficit for you. Now in the economy, what is what do we call the deficit in the economy? Say for example, if you want some money, if you want some money, but if you don't have it, technically we call it as a deficit in the economy. So in our classes, in the static classes, we have discussed about different kinds of deficits, right? Permanent deficit, revenue deficit, right? Fiscal deficits. We have discussed about these kind of a deficits. See, Imagine, let's take an example. Let's take an example. Imagine the government is earning a revenue of 100 rupees. Or say for example, let's consider the government is earning a revenue of 97 rupees. Now, you know how the government earns the revenue. The government imposes the taxes. We have the direct taxes and indirect taxes. Like direct taxes like income tax, corporate tax, securities transaction tax, capital gains tax in such a way, the government imposes different kinds of direct taxes and earn the money. And when we talk about the indirect taxes, we have the central excess duty, which is still being in relevance, in relevance in case of these petroleum products and alcohol based products. You know that these two products haven't been brought under the purview of the GST till now. Now, in such a way, the central excess duty and we have this GST, the CGST. By imposing these kind of indirect taxes, central government is going to collect the taxes collect the money. Now, by imposing the direct taxes and indirect taxes, it is going to generate the revenue that we have discussed in the chapter of the public finance very clearly. Now, in such a way, by imposing all these taxes and taking the loans plus loans, you know, often government raises the loans from the international financial institutions, right? In such a way, the government took MNC. In such a way, the government raised the money. Imagine, totally, the government wants to make an expenditure of 100 rupees. Say, for example, understand, the government currently earning a revenue of 97 rupees, but it wants to make an expenditure of 100. So what is the rest of the money? See, the government need extra 3 rupees. The government needs extra 3 rupees to make an expenditure of 100 rupees here. Right? Isn't it or not? See, what is the meaning of deficit? I told you, deficit is something, money which we need, but we don't have it. Technically, this 3 rupees is the money which the government need, but the government don't have it. Right? Now, we call it as a fiscal deficit. See, we call it as a deficit and when the government borrows this money, you know the meaning of the physical deficits. See, even the loan, see, even the loans, all this money, see, if the government has 97 rupees and if he wants to make an expenditure of 100, how the government can plug, government can source these 3 rupees, the government is go to go for the borrowings, the government goes for the borrowings and borrows 3 rupees and finally, it is going to be added to 100. So, definitely the deficits the budget deficits is definitely going to be the zero budget deficit means the budget expenditure minus budget receipts so 100 minus 100 is nothing but zero so at any given point of time the budget deficits would be zero in the economy now this three rupees which the government brought is called the fiscal deficits the outstanding liabilities of the government borrowings and liabilities of the government at the end of the financial year is called the fiscal deficit that we have discussed in our classes so understand guys now even this three rupees which is borrowed by the government now it is going to be to be spent in order to provide some kind of freebies freebies to the people this is the main problem see about 97 rupees most of the part is going for the revenue expenditure when we look at the data recently provided by the rbi now 
88.8% of the expenditure, say for example in the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, about 80% of their expenditure is revenue expenditure, which does not going to create any kind of an asset in the future. When it does not create any kind of an asset in the future, see it don't generate any kind of a revenue. If at all there is no asset at all, how could you expect it to generate a revenue? Now if there is no revenue generation in, in the future for the government, it is going to impose the tax burden on the future generations. Now thereby you can see the problems like tax evasion, tax avoidance, all all these kinds of a problems can be seen once the tax imposition is going to be very higher on the people in the particularly our future generations. So it is very important to go for more and more capital expenditure now so that it would generate a revenue in the future so that with that revenue taken by the government they don't impose a pressure on our future generations with respect to the taxes. This is how it should happen. Now but what is happening in the economy with recently right now you can clearly understand it from the RBI data like where the Kerala such as 90% of the revenue expenditure and the states of AP and Telangana are going for about 80% of the expenditure. So in such a way many of the states are going for the revenue expenditure which does not going to create any kind of an asset. Now the main concept is the main core bone of contention here is most of this revenue expenditure which is made by the government is to provide the freebies. Most of the revenue expenditure which is made by the government is used to provide the freebies. Even the borrowed money, the main concern is even the borrowed money, the 3 rupees money that we have discussed, the government borrows, is also going to be used to provide the freebies for the people. This is the main problem. This is the main problem. Now, this is the negative side what we are talking about the freebies. Now, in such a way when the things are going on, right, what should be the causes, what should be the solutions? What should be the solutions in the economy? There should be some checking mechanisms. When governments are going for these and these levels of fiscal deficits, by even they borrow the money and provide the freebies, then what is the checking mechanism? See, the checking mechanism is FRBM Act. The checking mechanism is FRBM Act, Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. Now this Fiscal Responsibility Budget Management Act says that the fiscal deficits of the government should not cross 3% of GDP at any given point of time. The fiscal deficits of the government should not cross 3% of the GDP at any given point of time. What is the fiscal deficit? The outstanding liabilities of the government at the end of the financial year is called borrowings. To put it simply, the borrowings made by the government in a financial year is called fiscal deficits. This 3 rupees in our above example is nothing but the fiscal deficits. So in such a way, the government's fiscal deficit should not cross 3% of the GDP is the term given by the this FRBM Act. Now, let's understand, let's understand. See, now this FRBM Act is going to consider, it is going to calculate the borrowings of the government. It is going to calculate the borrowings of the government, which is mentioned in the books, that's it. Which is mentioned in the books, books I mean to say budget. It is not going to calculate the off-budget liabilities. It is not going to calculate the off-budget liabilities of the government. And neither it is not going to calculate the borrowings made by the government, borrowings made by the government for which they haven't extended explicit guarantee, no explicit, no explicit guarantee. If the government does not give any kind of an explicit guarantee on the borrowings, these kind of a borrowings are not calculated in the FRBM Act. You say for example, if the off-budget liabilities, if the off-budget liabilities these off-budget liabilities are also have been going to be considered under this, this FRBM Act. I will give an example. Now take the example of Food Corporation of India. Now how the, let's understand how these off-budget liabilities are going to work. Now imagine we have the Food Corporation of India. I explained you about the central government food subsidy. What is central government food subsidy? Say for example, the Food Corporation of India is going to procure the food grains from the farmers at 100 rupees. And it need to be transporting it to the FCI Gordons, which cost it 25 rupees. And then it is need to be distributed to, to the state government depots, which also cost us 25 rupees. Let's take an example. Totally, we have 150 rupees. So we call this 150 rupees as economic cost of food grains of FCI. Economic cost of food grains to the FCI. So this 150 rupees is called economic cost of food grains to the FCI, which includes the MSP, transportation cost, and as well as distribution credentials. Now, at what cost it should be sold to the state government depots by the FCI? It should be sold at 150 rupees. Isn't it or not? But instead of that, it is going to sell it at 50 rupees. Now, the price at which 
the food corporation of india sells the food grains to the state government depots is called central issue price and in our example the central issue price is 50 rupees now it should sell it at 150 but it is selling at 50 rupees the balance here is 100 this is the loss for the fiscal food corporation of india and this 100 rupees is provided to the food corporation of india by the government of india as central government food subsidy as central government food subsidy see how, to, how do you express the central government food subsidy see economic cost of food grains for the fci minus central issue price so 150 minus 50 that is equal to 100 in such a way the government of india need to pay 100 rupees 100 rupees for the food corporation of india as a central government food subsidy now understand this 100 rupees is need to be paid to the food corporation of india definitely it is going to be a revenue expenditure for the government see if government spends 100 rupees in such a way as a expenditure now it is not going to create any kind of an asset in the future and it is not going to generate any revenue so definitely expenditure of these 100 rupees would be revenue expenditure but understand how this government is going to escape the frbm act now understand the government see understand this carefully how the f budget liabilities is going to work now the government will make the food corporation of india to borrow 50 rupees of the money the food corporation of india is asked by the government to borrow 50 rupees of the money now the government will borrow 50 rupees the government will borrow 50 rupees and it is going to give that 50 rupees to the food corporation of india let's consider let's imagine this hypothetical situation now imagine if government borrows if government borrows 100 rupees through the budget if government borrows 100 rupees and if it is directly by the government if government directly borrows 100 rupees and if it is being given to the food corporation of india the fiscal deficits might go to four percentage of the gdp let's understand it now if the government borrows just 50 rupees and gives it to the food corporation of india the fiscal deficit might be two percentage of the gdp now the FRBM Act says that the fiscal deficit should any point of time should not cross 2 percentage of the GDP, should any cost should not cross 3 percentage of the GDP. So 2 percentage is well within the limit of the 3 percentage. So in such a way the governments can escape from the FRBM Acts. But see if government borrows only 50 rupees and give it to the food corporation of India but food corporation of India need to get 100 rupees in total isn't it or not 50 plus 50. Now the food corporation of India is going to borrow that money under the guidelines of this central government. So what you have to understand our budget liabilities are the borrowings not made by the government but they are made by the public sector undertakings under the guidelines of central government. So, our budget liabilities are the liabilities or the borrowings made by the public sector undertakings under the guidelines of the government but not directly by the government. Now, if the PSUs makes the half-budget liabilities, it is not considered under the budgetary borrowings. Say for example, even it is the same for those kind of a borrowings made by the government for which the explicit guarantee is not given. Say for example, you, you know, totally the government, see totally there is a borrowings of 10 rupees. There is a borrowing of 10 rupees. Out of this, 3 rupees is borrowed by the public sector undertakings. So, if public sector undertakings borrows the money, we call them as off budget liabilities. And out of this, if an example, the state governments, the states have borrowed 4 rupees. The states have borrowed 4 rupees for which there is no guarantee, explicit guarantee from the exchequer. You know, you know, you have to give the guarantee that I will pay back the debt which you have given to me in return. Right? Such kind of such kind of a guarantee is not given, explicitly is not given. So these two is also not calculated under the FRBM Act. Now, what is the rest of the money? 3 plus 4, 7, and 10, 10 minus 7 is 3 rupees. Now the FRBM Act is only going to consider this 3 rupees as a borrowings made by the government. So, right? Now, this 3 rupees, which is the borrowings made by the public sector undertakings, and this 4 rupees, which is the borrowings made by the government itself but not explicit guarantee is given these kind of total 7 rupees are not calculated under the frbm act not calculated under the frbm act for the consideration of the fiscal deficits totally the government borrowed 10 rupees only totally the government borrowed 10 rupees but this off budget liabilities are not calculated but this explicit guarantee not given kind of a borrowings are also not calculated only those borrowings which are mentioned by the government in the budgetary books have been calculated in such a way in such a way the here the frbm is only going to calculate three rupees out of the total 10 rupees this is the main gap why this is the main lacuna i would say through which the governments are escaping the frbm act now the next two important mechanisms is this cag report 
Comptroller and Auditor General of India's report. By the time the CAG reports submits its report to the respective parliaments, respect to parliament and the state assemblies, the time is over. By the time they have already made the expenditure and it's lost its relevance. And so more, the third mechanism is opposition parties. The third mechanism is opposition parties. So when the opposition parties, opposition parties should question the government with respect to these kind of a freebies. Particularly when the government is going for more and more freebies, even though they are borrowing the money and they are escaping the ambit of the FRBM Acts, these opposition parties should question them. But due to the fear of the vote bank politics, many a times these opposition parties does not take a stand on the floor and questioning the government. So this is the, the see, in such a way, the FRBM Act Right? The CAG report, the CAG, as well as the opposition parties. Three, these governments are escaping the ambit of this FRBM Act by going, by going for more and more off-budget liabilities and those bearing, making those kind of a borrowings for which the government does not extend any kind of a sovereign guarantee, which are not calculated under the FRBM Act in such a way. By doing these kind of a things, they are escaping the net of this FRBM Act. Next, they are going for the this CAG report, lost its relevance. And finally, the opposition parties does not take a stand because of this um, old bank politics. Now, this is one side of the coin. So, this is about the freebies. So, in such a way, if government reduces the freebies and most and more and more, see, we, we have already discussed about the golden rule in the public finance. So, whatever the money that is borrowed by the government, it should be made as a capital expenditure. It should be done as a capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means, as I said in the beginning of the class, it should create some asset which generates some periodic revenue for the government so that it won't pose any kind of a tax burden on the future generations. But instead of that, Instead of that, if the see, this is called the golden rule in the public finance. Whatever the money borrowed by the government, it should be spent in the capital expenditure. But it is not being done by the government and even the borrowed money is going for the freebies. So, this kind of a freebies culture, it is going to set an extent that the revenue expenditure of the states is going to 88% and 99%. With particularly by promising these kind of irrelevant freebies for the people. So, in such a way, these freebies need to be curbed. These free, freebies need to be reduced. Is the is the discussion and the current affair which happened in the economy for the past one month. And you know, even the Prime Minister Narendra Modi also commented that this kind of a freebie culture should be reduced. Even the Supreme Court Chief Justice of India, C.V. Ramana, also commented upon these freebies. Now, these kind of a freebies need to be rationalized. This is the issue, this is the thing, current affair which gone on in the economy for the last one month. Now, now, recently, we are seeing the flip side of the coin of the freebies. Now, we are seeing the flip side of the coin of the freebies. Now, it is seen, when we talked about the freebies, mostly the freebies would be a revenue expenditure which does not create any kind of a general revenue, right, in the future. But the other side of the coin is, there are some expenditures, there are some revenue expenditures that should be made by the government in order to fulfill their constitutional responsibilities. The government often these days should go for fulfilling more and more constitutional responsibilities. Take the example of seeing, take the example of the food security, the PDS system being implementing in the country. Just now we have discussed about this um, central government food subsidy. See, the government of India implementing this PDS system, it is purchasing the food grains by the FCA and it is being distributed through the state depots to ultimate beneficiaries and the central government food subsidy and state government food subsidy is nothing but a revenue expenditure for the government. Now by implementing the PDS system, the people are getting the food security in the country. The people are provided with the food security in the country. On the other hand, see, by implementing the PDS system, you know that Food Corporation of India is going to pay the MSP, the Food Corporation of India is going to pay the MSP for the farmers and this MSP is going to be a remunerative price for the farmers, isn't it? See, remunerative price means definitely it would be more than the cost of production. In the previous classes when we discussed about the MSP, I told you MSP is constituted like 150 percentage into the cost of production. Say for example, if the cost of production of 1 kg of paddy is 100, the, pro the farmers is provided with 150 rupees as a supportive mechanism, as a remunerative remunerative price. You can understand it's a minimum remunerative price for the farmers. In such a way, by implementing the PDS system on one hand, the government is making sure there is a food security in the economy. On the other hand, it is going to generate and it is going to earn some revenue for the farmers so that they can live a standard of living. When government is making this kind of an expenditure, of course, let it get come under the revenue expenditure. Who bothers when these kind of a people are getting benefited in the economy? How could you club these kind of expenditures made by the government on the public distribution system and MSP? as a freebie. This is the main question. This is the flip side of the coin. I hope you understood. Not only the PDS system guys. See, take the example. See, 
under the Pradhan Mantri menu. We have discussed about this National Food Security Act. Under the Public Class vs Union of India case, the Supreme Court held that the right to food becomes a legal right under Article Right to Life under Article 21. So, as a result of it, the Government of India enacted the National Food Security Act and it is using the targeted public distribution system, which is already rationing system, which is already prevalent in the country to implement this act. Now, when government spends some money, definitely it is going to be a revenue expenditure upon these initiatives. But by spending such kind of money, it is providing the food security to the people and it is also providing some remunerative price for the farmers so that they will have some standard of living. When constitutional responsibilities are being fulfilled by the governments in order to make this kind of an expenditure, particularly let it be revenue expenditure, it doesn't bother. When constitutional responsibilities are being fulfilled by the governments in order to implement these kind of a schemes, how can these can be clubbed as as a freebies is the main question, is the flip side of the question, right? Next, the matter, the discussion does not end with the public distribution system. Take the example of the Manrega, Manrega systems. See, you know the Manrega, Mahatma Gandhi National Employment, Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Now, it is going to provide some 100 days of guaranteed employment for the rural people. Now, when these people get some guaranteed employment, they are going to generate some revenue for them. When they get some revenue, definitely their standard of living is going to get increased. With that income, they are going to purchase some basic goods and services required for their survival. Right? When they purchase this kind of a goods and services required for their survival, definitely their standard is going to get increased, their standard of life is going to get increased. Then how could you club these kind of a initiatives taken by the government in order to fulfill their constitutional responsibilities as a freebies? How could these can be clubbed as a freebies? Right? This is the next important question. See, the PDS system, the MSP, the Mandrega Act, take the example of midday meal scheme. Take the example of midday meal scheme. Now, this kind of a midday meal scheme is also ensuring the nutritional security of the children. Now, the expenditure made by the government of India in implementing this kind of a midday meal scheme is definitely going to be a revenue expenditure. How could you club the revenue expenditure made on the midday meal scheme as a freebie when it is helping the people? Now, these kind of an arguments came into forefront when these freebies are altogether to be removed. Now, so more, the some of the experts have even went on to criticize to an extent that, see, these days, in order to encourage the corporate sector, in order to encourage the corporate sector, the government is giving a tax incentives of about 5 lakh crores every year. When government is providing 5 lakh, when government is foregoing, government is, see, they need to pay 5 lakh crores to the, understand this concept. If the corporate sector is truly taxed, they need to pay 5 lakh crores extra every year to the government. In order to increase the corporate sector, the government of India is giving about 5 lakh crore incentives. So, the freebies given to the corporate sector for their engagement is called incentives. But these kind of a social welfare schemes, when the government wants to try to implement its constitutional responsibilities and spend some revenue expenditure, it is called freebies. How could it be a rational thing? When these kind of incentives are provided to the corporate sector, they are not called freebies. When these kind of constitutional responsibilities are fulfilled by the government, they are called freebies. How could it be? How could these two can be clubbed? How good? It is a good thing. How could the providing incentives to increase the corporate sector and revenue foregone of 5 lakh? Revenue foregone means the revenue which is gone, or which the government don't want to take in order to increase the corporate sector. When these kind of things are called incentives, not freebies, but these kind of things need are called freebies. Now, how could this be, this can be clubbed? How could it be a corporate sector revenue foregone 5 lakh rupees is an incentive? How could the PDA system, the MSP, the midday meal spill kind of a program, so which the government making a revenue expenditure could be a freebie? This is the main question which came into forefront. Now, recently, even the Supreme Court asked the Election Commission of India to give its stand. Now, when the Election Commission of India is taking its stand, it said that it is not going to participate in the committee that is going to get appointed on the rationalization of the freebies. Now, the Election Commission of India said the freebie for a one person might not be a freebie for the other person. It is subjective. Take the example. Now, if you go to the Kerala, imagine there is a floods altogether in Kerala. Now, in the Kerala, government of India designs a scheme, a disaster relief scheme and pays the money. It might be a freebie for him. And that kind of a freebie at that particular time is very much essential. Now, it is not going to be essential in the normal times. So, in such a way, the freebies is always subject to. So, it is from it should be looked from the perspective of the person who is receiving it. The person who is receiving it always says such kind of schemes is needed. But the rest of the persons who don't receive it says that it is not required in the normal times. So, in such a way, in such kind of rationalizing freebies mechanism committees, we are not going to take part because it is going, it has provided its own stand for the Supreme Court. So, in 
such a way the things are going on in the economy so on the flip side on the one side we are just discussed so far about the negative side of the freebies on the other side we just now discussed about the positive sides of the economy uh, freebies so these positive sides and negative sides of the freebies should not be clubbed together and everything should not be called the freebies there should be a rationalization of irrational schemes and there should be a continuation of this kind of a revenue expenditure and these kind of msp speedier system which ensures some food security and decent standard of living to the people and it is in fact the constitutional mandate of the government to fulfill these kind of responsibilities so these kind of a revenue expenditure should be continued and that kind of irrational expenditure need to be curbed and this is the mandate of the committee which need to be constituted in the upcoming rationalization of the freebies in india right i hope you have understood this concept in its entirety this is about this concept guys see and recently even the supreme court asked the finance commission to give its stand on upon the freebies so i hope you understood this concept in its entirety so guys freebies see free is these days the free base are being provided to the people it, there might be a question like critically evaluate the free bee culture in india critically evaluate when we talk about the critically evaluation critically analyze whatever there is a thing called critical you need to analyze both the positive sides of the thing as well as the negative things of the thing so you have to show you have to provide the you have to provide the both side of the coins to the examiner i hope you have understood this concept very clearly right now this is about this scheme guys now this is about this freebies so far now next we are going to talk about the next topic the quiznets hypothesis and india's unique job crisis it's very simple guys i would like to explain you like in the previous classes itself we have discussed about what is the meaning of a labor labor force and all each and everything what is a labor force what is a labor force a labor force is nothing but see those people who are employed plus unemployed that too in the age of working age that too in working age is called labor is comes under the labor force employee means upon the activity status on the activity status on the basis of activity status we are going to define a person as employee or unemployed say for example if a person is engaged in economic activity all the activities where the money is involved is called economic activities if a person is engaged in economic activities that is working then we call him as an employee and if a person is not engaged in any kind of an economic activity but if he seeks to work if he is ready to the work he is called an employee right now only these two persons comes under that to between the working age 15 to 59 comes under this labor force definition right this is about the labor force when we see i hope you understood the meaning of labor force when we look at the ratio of the labor force the main intention is most of the people in india at the time of independence are dependent on the agriculture are dependent on the agriculture most of the labor force in india are dependent on the agriculture you just look at the table see the share of the workforce in agriculture about 61.9 percentage of the people were dependent on the agriculture during 1993 and 1994 by 2020 and 2021 even today the 44.8 percentage of the people are dependent on the agriculture see here and even in 2011 47 percentage of the people are dependent on the agriculture and for, even now in 2020 and 2021 44 percentage of the people are dependent on the agriculture what is the meaning of dependent of the people 44 percent of the people dependent on agriculture understand now imagine there are 100 people as a labor force and just now you have understood the meaning of labor force and even in the previous economic weekly series we have clearly understood the meaning of this labor force now imagine there are 100 labor forces 100 people as a labor force now about 40 percentage of the people are dependent on the agriculture sector about 30 percentage of the people are dependent on the secondary sector right total see 45 percentage exactly it is 45 percentage on the agriculture sector say for example 30 percent on the secondary sector and rest of the 25 percentage on the the tertiary sector in such a way out of the total 100 labor force the 45 30 and 25 are divided in such a way say 45 70 30 100 percentage of the people total 100 people are divided in such a way they are dependent on the agriculture for their livelihood 30 percent of the people are dependent on the livelihood for the secondary sector and 25 percent of the people are dependent on the tertiary sector which is nothing but your services sector here the main contention the main issue is we have a lot of disguised unemployment in the agriculture sector disguised unemployment now what is the meaning of disguised unemployment understand guys imagine it's a plot of land it's a plot of land 
and it's a one acre of land and in this one acre of land we can produce the farmers are producing 100 kg of rice say for example the father the mother right the son and the three siblings the son and the three siblings all five are working in this one acre of land but understand in order to cultivate this one acre of land we just need two people two people are enough to cultivate this one acre of land and they can produce 100 kg of rice now now imagine all of a sudden i went to that particular area and i have constructed a factory there and i brought these three people and i brought these three people to make to work in this particular factory then do you think it is the productivity of this particular farmland is going to decrease thus the production of 100 kgs might be decreased to 80 kgs no why because now even just I, in the beginning i said you just to cultivate this farmland two people is enough and the rest of the three people even though they are remote now just they are see these five people what they are doing in the initial phases they are just dividing the two people's work among the five people now we call this as a disguised unemployment right even if these three people are removed from the factories the three people are removed from the agriculture sector and provided the employment in the factories the food production is not going to get decreased the productivity of the agriculture is not going to decrease because two people can enough to be to cultivate the farmland now we call it as a disguised unemployment i will give another example for you now imagine this is a factory and there are 10 people currently working in this particular factory with this 10 people working there the factory is producing 10 goods now all of a sudden a three new people are employed in it and with this three people they should produce 13 goods but instead of 13 producing 13 goods they're still producing the same 10 goods so the marginal productivity the extra productivity of the three people is zero now when the marginal productivity is zero remember this term when the marginal productivity when the marginal productivity of an employee is zero then we call such kind of employment as disguised unemployment in such a way the disguised unemployment is at a large scale in the in the agriculture sector in india it's one of the important problem of the disguised unemployment right see now i will give you a bar graph say for example see this contribution see contribution of the labor force and contribution see contribution of the labor force for the agriculture sector contribution three sectors of the economy contribution of these three sectors to the gdp see when it comes to the labor force the primary sector is contributing more next contributing the secondary sector and next contributing the tertiary sector as far as gdp contribution is concerned first the tertiary sector is contributing more then secondary sector then the primary sector now you can clearly observe see if i assign the values 50 percentage 30 and 20 about 50 percentage 30 and 20 see 50 percentage of the people are dependent on the primary sector the labor force of 50 percentage is dependent on the primary sector but labor but the primary sector contribution to the gdp is 20 percentage only 20 percentage of the people is dependent on the tertiary sector and its contribution to the gdp is about 50 percentage in such a way you can clearly observe the disguised unemployment in the primary sector now many of the experts all around the country not only the country all over the world have suggested that these kind of a labor force from the agriculture sector need to be diversified for the secondary sector this kind of a labor force from the agriculture sector need to be diversified for the secondary sector and tertiary sector tertiary sector sector why even though if the labor force got diversified from the agriculture sector to the secondary sector and tertiary sector it is not going to reduce its productivity because there is a huge of huge level of disguised unemployment in the country now the current affair is even today even after three decades or four decades even the people even today the number of people dependent upon the agriculture is more so the disguised unemployment still continues to be even this decade even in 2021 there are 40 percentage of the people dependent 44 to 45 percentage of the people are dependent on agriculture but its contribution to the gdp is just around 20 percentage so you can clearly observe if the successful governments have failed in moving the labor force from the agriculture sector to the rest of the sectors now the agriculture labor force have moved there there is no denying the fact that the agriculture the number of people dependent on the agriculture decreased from 61.9 percentage to 41 44.9 percentage 44.8 percentage what does that mean the number of people dependent on the agriculture got reduced 
it's okay it's reduced but these people haven't been diversified with the secondary sector or tertiary sector which adds more and more value you see for the secondary sector we have a more value addition now the country's gdp is being led by the secondary sector tertiary sector now in such a way the labor force haven't been moved to the tertiary sector and the labor intensive manufacturing sector but they moved out of the agriculture sector to the informal sector they worked as a construction laborers they are working as a daily wage laborers in such a way they have moved out of this agriculture sector but they went into the formal sector but they went into the informal sector i would say they went into the informal sector but not for the secondary sector and tertiary sector which adds a higher value see india have too many people in agriculture the inability to move the surplus labor from the farm constitutes a major policy failure of the successful governments in 1993 1994 as i look at the data 62% of the people are dependent on the labor force employed in the labor force in agriculture overall it got reduced from 61.9 percentage to 41.84 percentage by 2018 and 19 right now what does it mean even the movement of workforce from the agriculture that india has witnessed over the past three decades from 62 it got reduced to 44 does not qualify as what economics economists call as structural transformation right why such transformation would involve transfer of the labor force from the farming to the other sectors particularly the manufacturing and modern services where productivity and value addition and average incomes are high but these are largely absorbed in the construction and services these are see the surplus labor pulled out from the farms is being largely absorbed in the construction activities and services related services the bulk of the jobs are in the petty sectors petty sectors such as retailing sector small eateries domestic helplines sanitation security staffing transportation and similar other informal economic activities they are not the labor force dependent on the agriculture have been reduced from 60 percentage to 40 percentage it's okay the data is clear but they haven't moved they haven't been diversified to the secondary sector and the value addition tertiary sector they have moved to this kind of informal sector like right? they have moved to this kind of informal sector so the economist does not call it as a structural transformation we don't call it as structural transformation somebody might claim that see the labor force have been moving out of this agriculture sector to the rest of the sectors but to what sectors there now we call it as a structural structural transformation no we can't call it as a structural formation because they haven't been moved to the secondary and the tertiary sectors but they have moved to the informal sectors right this is the main problem simply put structural transformation process in india has been weak and deficient this is about this current affair now you can observe you see these kind of a topics are very much important from the perspective of the indian economy particularly from the primary sector this clearly shows the hypothesis of the kuznets in the economy this kind of a situation shows the hypothesis of the kuznets see what this kuznets causes is see initially with the increase in the per capita income in a developing country initially in the developing country with the increase in the per capita income after a period of time if with the increase in the per capita income inequalities will increase now if the per capita income increases inequalities increases if the per capita income further increases for the people the in income inequalities further is going to get increased now it is going to get increased to till that point we call it as a turning point now after a turning point the income inequalities among the people is going to start reducing again see it is going to get start reducing again after a period of time the income inequalities among the people is not is start is going to go reduced so even the if the further after a certain period of time even the per capita income increases it is going to reduce the income inequalities among the people now it is a typical phenomenon with the increase in the per capita income initially income inequalities increases is a typical phenomenon seen in the developing country developing countries and by the time even if after a certain turning point even if the per capita income further increases it is going to reduce the income inequalities is a typical example of a developed country now what the kuznets cause says in a developing economy with the increase in the per capita income initially the income inequalities increases but after if the per capita income further increases continuously the income inequality decreases after a period of time and by that time the developing country at the initial phase might become a developed country this is about the kuznets curve so see this is a familiar to the kuznets process named by the american average. this phenomenon what we have seen in the economy is similar to this kuznets curve so i hope you have understood this statement this current affair also right
The next one what we are going to discuss is the India's banking sector shows progress. The RBS latest financial stability report has given a banking system a reasonably clean bill of health. It is significant achievement considering the stress of the previous decades, a shock of the pandemic associated with the slowdown. Now here, now before we go and discuss about this NPS, let's have a brief idea about what is this NPS, what is an asset and what is all these things. Now un understand guys, what is the meaning of an asset? An asset is something which earns some periodic revenue for you. You construct a building, give it on a rent, it is your asset. You construct a um, building, give it on a rent, it will be your asset because it is going to generate some periodic revenue in the form of rental income. If you construct a building, if you yourself, yourself is going to live in it, it is going, not going to generate any kind of a rental income and it can't be your asset. So an asset is something which generates some periodic revenue for the persons who holds it. In case of the banks, the loans are called the assets. Why? Because if the banks extends the loans, the person who took it is going to pay back the loans in the payment of, I mean, it is, he is going to pay the interest payments. So it is considered as a periodic revenue for the banks and it is the loans are considered as an asset. Right? Isn't it or not? Now we are going to consider the classification of performing assets. Now when we look at the meaning of performing assets or particularly we also call it as a standard assets. What is the meaning of performing assets? The asset is performing. Asset is performing means those person who took the loan are paying back the interest payments and also the principal amount periodically. We call it as a performing asset or standard asset. Now see the next one is those persons who took the loan haven't been paying the haven't been paying haven't been paying the interest rate or even the principal even after 90 days we call it as non-performing asset the asset is not performing non-performing asset i hope you can understand the next one if the nps continues for 12 months if the nps continues for 12 months or less then we call it as is a substandard asset then we call it a substandard asset next if the substandard asset continues for 12 months then we call it as a doubtful asset and finally, we have the loss asset. If, if an asset is found to be lost, that the person who took it, didn't, the person who took the loan haven't been paid the loan or even the principal. If it is found by the banks in its internal audit process by the, by the audit of the RBA, then it is called a loss asset. So in such a way, we have the classification of the performing asset, standard asset, non-performing asset, substandard asset, doubtful asset and lost asset. A performing asset, non-performing asset means a person who took the loan haven't been paid the interest and the principal even after 90 days we call it as a non-performing asset if a non-performing asset continues for 12 months it is called substandard asset if the substandard asset continues for 12 months we call it as a doubtful asset and if it is found in the internal audit of the banks or rbi we call it as a lost asset right loss asset now see these days we have this recapitalization of the bonds see the government have taken various initiatives the government have taken various initiatives like insolvency, bankruptcy code of India, bad bank, recapitalization of the banks. These are the asset reconstruction companies, Surface Act. In such a way, the government of India and RBI came up with the different initiatives now which reduced the problem of NPS in the economy. See, right? In such a way, recently about 8.8 percentage, about 8.8 .8 lakh crores of NBS have been recovered in the last eight fiscal years because of these initiatives. Now, when we look at this credit growth, see, Availability, if NPS of the banks have been cleared, it is going to provide a lot of loan to the entrepreneurs and in the previous classes we have discussed, if a bank provides more and more loans to the entrepreneurs, it is going to create some capital assets, with this employment generation is going to get created and the GDP is also country is also going to get increased. Now in such a way, clearing the NPA problems to make sure the banks provide the loans to the entrepreneurs and companies is very much essential to create the employment as well as the GDP growth in the economy. So in such a way, clearing the NPA problems of the banks, clearing the balance sheets of the banks with the NPAs for the NPAs is very much important. So the role of credit in supporting the GDP is very much important. Once the NPS of the banks is cleared, it can extend the loans. So the reluctance of the banks to provide the credit to the industries. These days, over the last decade, the banks are increasingly shifting away from providing the credit to the industry because they there are a lot of chances that these loans given to the industries might become an NPS. So industries, I mean, the banks are becoming reluctant to provide the loans to the industries, which are the main, which is very important for the Indian economy to generate some revenue. If industries produces the goods and services, can be it will provide the employment and it will provide it will make the employments demand the goods and services so that the GDP of the economy get increased. Now see if the government provides loans, if the banks provides loans, it might the entrepreneurs took the loans and they will 
establish some factories, say book manufacturing factory and a cloth manufacturing factory. The, the people need to work here, the people will get employment here. These guys will receive the salary from this shop. These guys are also going to receive the salary from here. The salary received, they demand the uh, cloths. With the salary received by them, they are going to demand the books. In such a way, the economy, if more and more goods and services are demanded, it is going to contribute to the GDP. So, providing the loans to the industry is very, very much important. But we have seen these kind of NPA problems, particularly in these industries. So, banking is favoring MSME in the industry loans. Bulk of the industry loans have been extended to the small firms, MSMEs. You know, the MSME sector is one of the PRT sector lending for the banks, which benefited from the credit guarantee schemes offered by the government in the wake of pandemic. So, Reasons why there is so little lending for the investment with the large firms, demand side reason. On the demand side, private sector investment have been sluggish for the near a decade. The boom and burst of the mid-2020s, I mean mid-2000, had saddled the firms with the excess capacity, giving them a little reason to expand their productivity facilities. So these are like supply side reasons like, you know, during the 2004-9, GDP growth rate in the Indian economy was fueled by an unprecedented lending boom. We have seen this crisis also. Subsequently, many of those loans turned bad, leading to high level of NPS on the bank's balance sheets. You know, when we discussed about the reasons for the, see, you know the meaning of credit bubble, you know the meaning of bubble. Like if you keep on um, blowing the air into the bubble, after a period of time, this bubble is going to get burst. Now, in a similar way, if the banks keep on giving more and more credit to the people, it is going to get burst after a period of time. As a result of it, these financial problems, banks for a decade were unable to extend their way to the credit because of this problem. So, these are the problems. When we look at the challenges, now in order to solve the problem, fundamental problem has been not solved. What is it? Uh, both on the negative side, the fundamental problems that led to the difficulties of the past decade have not been solved yet. No framework for the risk reduction. There is still no framework that will reduce the risk of the private sector investment in infrastructure, set, certainly not in the critical and high troubled power sector. There is now there is any reassurance for the banks that if the problem do develop, they can be resolved explicitly since the insolvency and bankruptcy code has been plagued by delays and other problems. We have discussed about the insolvency and bankruptcy code problems also. Say for example, if this, see, insolvency situation when a person can't pay the loans and if the national company law tribunal in the ICBC code, in the IBC code, national company law tribunal is the one which is going to solve the insolvency process of the companies. When the national company law tribunal is going to declare that this particular person is insolvent and it cannot pay the loan, then it is called bankruptcy. Legal declaration of the insolvency situation is called bankruptcy. Now the NCV, this National Company Law Tribunal is going to appoint an insolvency professional and the management of this company is going to be transferred to the committee of the creditors, which is the committee which paid the loans to this particular company. Now this insolvency professional will come and try to revive the company. If possible, it will revive it. And if possible, he is going to liquidate it or sell it off. And if he wants to sell it off, they are going to go for the open bidding. And whatever the difference between the persons, say for example, the per, the, com, the creditors need to get 100 rupees, but in the bidding of this company, it just went to 80 rupees. So this 80 rupees, need to be accepted by 75% of the creditors. The decision to sell this company at 180 rupees need to be accepted by 75% of the community of creditors. If it is accepted, the 80 rupees have, will be given to them. But they need to get 100 rupees and the difference between this amount what they want to get but the what they got, the difference between the 120, 20 rupees need, need to be paid as a loss by the, com by the creditors. Now we call it as haircut. Now we have discussed about all these insolvency and bankruptcy code in, this, in our static classes very clearly. So guys, we have discussed about the freebies today. Like we have seen the negative side of the freebies and we have seen the positive side of the freebies. Now we have critically evaluated the topic freebies in our class. Next we have discussed about the disguised unemployment problem which is faced by the primary sector in the economy and we also understood about the Kuznets hypothesis and Kuznets curve. Next we have discussed about the reduction of NPS in the problem but these NPS, see once these NPS are cleared, reducing, the bank should extend this credit to the large companies which creates the employment as well as the employment generation and contributes to the GDP. But because of the past decades problem, still these problems haven't been recovered, now the loans to this particular sector is being reduced. Now these are like these are the problems which are currently the banking sector is facing. So I hope you have clearly understood all these three important topics that we have discussed in detail. So guys, we have some of the current affairs which are also in transition and the next week we are going to discuss these current affairs. So from the next week it would be a continuous matter like where we are going where you are going to get this economic weekly in every week. 
so in such a way just open just listen to the class have a book note all these kind of a perspectives in your book these kind of a topics are very much important from your mains perspective guys upsc asks these kind of a perspectives from you not the facts and data right i hope is the nature of the upsc exam so guys so you have i hope you have understood and enjoyed this class thank you and stay tuned to rathor's is for the next week's economic weekly series thank you